Hello everyone, today we're going to take a look at the peculiarity of the Norman Kingdom of Sicily. Um, so, I have done just, I think, a couple of videos about, I think only one actually, about specifically the Norman Kingdom of Sicily. I think I discussed something else about the Angevins, um, the Aragonese, yeah, definitely, even more than, one, um, than two videos. Um, but I never got into detail into the history of the uh, Norman Kingdom, and unfortunately, um, I must tell you, we will not do it even today. In the sense that, uh, you know, that my videos at the moment are pretty uh, manualistic in in nature, so they're kind of introductory. But you know, at the same time, looking at a bit more of a critical uh, understanding, because you know, if you want to really know. In a nutshell, the 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 history of a certain kingdom, medieval kingdom. Even you know, Wikipedia can be more uh, proper. You know, you find all the data, all the names, uh, all the dates, all everything you 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 want to do. It's already pretty much concise. I could make a video just repeating what is written on Wikipedia, but I think it would be a waste of time, of mine as well as your time. Um, so I'm not saying that Wikipedia should be uh, taken as the uh, you know as anything uh, externally refined, but hey, especially the English Wikipedia is not so bad in in history. So if you really want to get the essentials, why not? Um, naturally, um, also in there you can find a, a real um, bibliography, so you can't complain about it. In the sense, if you want to know more, there are I'm just looking right now. There are like 43 titles, so all kind of academic publications that you can go look at and, and in this sense I that those are way more effective than, than I am. Um, I however would like to point out certain things you don't find actually on Wikipedia because they're not you maybe find on, on those academic publications because they uh, hopefully they have it but that they're not uh, let's say so um, information that are not so telegraphic like the ones on Wikipedia or in any other um, synthesis, etc. Um, and this interest stems from, from many reasons, actually. First of all, I, uh, I admit I never had a, 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 an enormous interest in um, <coughs> in, uh, in the Norman Kingdom of Sicily as such. I mean, I definitely uh, read several books sometimes, even some time ago, telling the truth. Uh, but I never got, first of all, quite satisfied by it because um, it's. I think there is still much to study and to research about it, uh, not just during the Norman period, but also and especially in the later ones, especially uh, the times of Frederick II. You th you might think I don't know. Uh, we know everything about Frederick II, uh, Holy Roman Emperor, <coughs> King of Sicily, etc., etc. All the long titles he had. Well, as a matter of fact, we don't and. Um, as far as I know, there is a pretty, I can't say flourishing, uh, field of research um, uh, relatively to this topic, but definitely, as far as I know, as, as long as people research in this field, everybody, um, you know, there, there is always something new coming coming out from the archives, coming from uh, certain reconsiderations, and definitely the history of the um, uh, the Kingdom of Sicily is enormous, even if we want to um, <coughs> stick to Norman times that weren't, after all, extremely uh, long because the kingdom, of si the, the Norman Kingdom of Sicily definitely lasted from, uh, okay, it, it began in, in, in the mid 11th century as a, actually as a Norman dominion and it became a kingdom only in the beginning of the 12th century formally from an institutional point of view and then at the end of the same century um, the the Oteville dynasty went extinguished, and with the uh, imperial, actually royal, no, well, I don't remember whether Henry had the sixth had already been uh, associated by Frederick to the throne. However, of the Holy Roman Empire, however, the royal marriage between, in fact, Henry the sixth of Hohenstaufen and, and uh, Constance of Oteville, the last heiress of the. <coughs> Sicula Norman Kingdom, let's put it in these terms, um, eventually passed to, to the Swabians with all the problems and so on, and you can look at the history of um, of the Kingdom of Sicily as a from, from that point onwards as a very, um, say, problematic one, as, of course, there were moments of 
kind of um, of prosperity under both under Frederick II and even under the Angevins. Telling the truth, they are told of they were just nothing but conquerors and foreigners in there. Well, arguably also the Swabians, who were in fact Henry VI had to fight pretty harsh uh, war to. <coughs> Eventually, against the uh, the prince of of uh, Taranto to to get you know because of the 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 Normans uh, those Normans had uh, had remained um, there w didn't really want to, to give up their their dominion um, and it's a, a pretty tormented history in general because it's this uh, excuse me this kingdom that kind of had enormous potential. Uh, probably much more than, than than others, especially at the time of its foundation. Eventually, we can say that at the beginning of the 13th century, it's France that eventually manages to, to rocket to the stars. But by uh, 11th century standards, definitely the Kingdom of Sicily in Europe was the not only the, the one with the highest potential, but also the most advanced and most uh, centralized of all Latin Germanic Europe. So... Uh, today we're going to look essentially at this and how, how w w what what made it so special and how this was and and what is particularly interesting about it it was that it it it, it was kind of um um i don't know to say this uh, there was definitely a um um twinning let's say um of the uh, two uh, Norman kingdoms in Europe, the one of England and the one of Sicily, because objectively it was perceived um, there was a common origin in in many ways uh, as Normans, as and this is also a bit complicated to explain because sometimes people have difficulties to understand what what, what is Norman at this point, what does that mean? Uh, that's maybe something we will leave for another video. But essentially, there are many misconceptions even in, about how the same. Um, Sicil Norman Kingdom was created. Sicil Norman Kingdom was essentially a um, a creation um, that so I would say equally the the Norman commitment and the papal one. Um, and never underestimate at this point. Excuse me, I I set up s uh, in, in a more comfortable way. And I have discussed about this topic specifically in the in a video that it was pretty old, probably in this sense not extremely first of all not very long, secondly, maybe not ex excessively detailed and i I wish I had said much more. I could even maybe delete that and repeat it in in a proper fashion. Or maybe just creating a new one. Uh, so here, medieval, uh, medieval Italy. Um, ah, actually, no. I mean, also ha another video that can be interesting for you. Well, the very first one w was titled um, "Significance of the Norman Conquest of Sicily," and here, especially, I understand how. Excuse me, I, I explain how it was. Mm, this the Norman domination was created and framed into the um, politics of the time and the relation with the papacy, this is definitely important, but also made another one I had forgot, not really forgotten but now I hadn't to told you that is ruling Norman Sicily, management of a Mediterranean empire. This is also pretty interesting in my opinion because it was one of the few videos I <laughs> actually like how they, they turned, um, because um, it's essentially um, a um, really a, norm, a cyclo -norma Norman perspective from a um, in terms of international politics. You know, no, really, what, what it meant, how how far did the um, the Norman domain extended into the Mediterranean? How what what the main goals were the relations with the Byzantine Empire with Tunisia, uh, naturally also with even with the uh, Principality of Antioch that was a secular Norman. It was ruled by uh, Bohemond of Hauteville, in fact, and uh, so the relation also with the the Papacy, the the Holy Roman Empire, and even Egypt. So this, uh, even Spain, because mm, and and that's 
an interesting video because it's a perspective that is rarely considered. Sometimes when you read about history, you, you just uh, look in, here, you know, in third person. You know, this um, kingdom did this and did that. It, it's as if it had its own, uh, every kingdom had its own borders, its own... But telling the truth, what was happening all over, literally all over the Mediterranean, all over Europe had enormous reflections all over the world system. Never think of the Middle Ages as, you know, guys who were, uh, you know, so uh, nicely and quietly in their own land and uh, that it was all about that. No, um, uh, the world was globalized at that time, is obviously not as much as today, but still in a way that really couldn't make you uh, sleep, uh, say, peaceful dreams if you were especially a ruler of these um but also simply a subject of, of such dominions. But this is not important. That the important here he is to understand how far in range that really the secular Norman kingdoms could uh, extend its influence. It, it's it's crazy sometimes because um, sometimes I talked with people who were allegedly um, and self-proclaimedly um, passion about Norman history and they neither had heard about the Norman Kingdom of Sicily. You know, when you figure out, oh my god, did the Normans get to Sicily? How did this happen? When did this happen? I didn't know that, you know, uh, I mean, pick up a, a history, medieval history manual, <laughs> Man, I mean, seriously, that's bad, very bad. And um, so I always take the chance to talk about this topic very, very gladly, because if I can, and uh, indeed, if I also hear my, my Google test, let's say, <laughs> I, go I usually Google sometimes the topics I want to talk about, um, it, it, I don't really, uh, or at least it happens, tell the truth, it happens when I already made the video, so just to get, to, to see whether it, it pops out among the first results on YouTube or somewhere else, and, and there are certain topics I think th there might be much about, and instead there is nothing, and practically, the one about the, uh, the Kingdom of Sicily is practically this. Uh, the only people who seem to, to get interested in this are either professional historians who make tiny little points in this perspective of um, hyper-specialization that our academies are basically basically becoming all about, so lacking uh, also mm, uh, an overall perspective, or at least maybe having it, but not disclosing it to the great public. Either it's simply videos about someone who I know is fascinated because they associate this to kind of uh, Normans with uh, with Sicily, so this kind of exotic mix uh, of, of sorts that uh, it's fascinating the Normans in Sicily, but then nobody actually talks about the history of this kingdom or does it very superficially by I don't know copying things from Wikipedia or I don't know what. So I, and, and, and 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 I was shocked personally by this gap, by this uh, vacuum, because what the hell? Uh, this is probably one of the most important chapters of the world medieval history. Why is that? But people don't talk about it. Ways that people don't even consider it, and uh, sadly, we know the reasons why this happened, and there are multiple reasons actually, um, but they're completely unjustifiable. So, in my very small space, I, I hope I I can contribute to um, shed a bit of not really of light, because as I was saying before, these are things you can Google easily. I mean. You can find documents, you can find sites, pages that that texts that talk about the Norman Kingdom of Sicily, but a very few videos. That's the point I wanted to to make. So when I, I say I Google, I I don't find things. That's that's what I mean. It's not that there are not things on the internet about the Norman Kingdom of Sicily in absolute terms or extensive material written about it. It's simply that when you look si at sites like YouTube. <coughs> That's a bit of a test of what people get entertained with, and uh, and if you don't find anything consistent, you might say, "What the hell?" Um, so, mm, what else? What did you say? Well, okay, we can really start with the object of our. So, first of all, a point that I already made. Maybe we can reformulate a little. 
in one of the last videos, um, I mean, in one of the videos I already made, chiefly the one on the significance of the Norman conquest of Sicily, is in many ways the the importance that the Norman domini domination had for the political unity of southern uh, Italy. Now, this is something that's not given for granted, because definitely people are not passionate about the Normans of Sicily, they're even less interested in pre-Norman uh, southern Italy. But this is another topic that telling the truth needs to be um, discussed widely. I made a video on the southern Longobards that are a pretty big chunk of what basically um, southern Italian history was in the early Middle Ages. Um, but generally speaking, when you look at pre-Norman southern Italy, the, the first thing you notice is the extremely high degree of fragmentation that existed at the time. I don't know why, but um, there is this perception that uh, the telling the truth comes straight from 19th century um, positivistic slash mm, crypto-racist um, conceptions that, I don't know, the lands of the Mediterranean most exposed to, to the Eastern influences were kind of um, used to get ruled by someone. Especially with Italy, this is kind of a very um, very f frequent cliché. You know, the idea that more or less the, in, the Italians had all these kind of dominations, so this meant that they, they would be allegedly um, um, uh, you know, harmless or, you know, weak or I don't know what. Uh, if there is a country that historically has been always a nightmare to govern in uh, under any possible point of view, it's exactly Italy. Because, simply because the local communities have never actually cared about getting involved into a higher business. They all wanted to have their own thing, they all wanted their own uh, space, and they were quite, um, let's say, and there was always a, a kind, especially for these foreign dominations that began at this point with the Normans also, well, with the Normans it was a bit different, especially in later times in the southern uh, lands, uh, sort of compromise, uh, political bargaining of the local, especially the local aristocracy, not even the the commoners, let's say, that always wanted to have their own space, to, to have their own business, to to deal with their own stuff and having the government um, dealing with a, a very few with them. This is in a nutshell how even how mafia was, was born. And this is actually not an Italian feature because before the the creation of um, centralized states in, in modern Europe, in modern and contemporary Europe, the whole political um, practice was indeed like this. I mean, medieval Europe, let's be honest about it, the whole medieval European history, just like in any uh, other place where there, there was a not a centralized authority, was uh, a mobster-like uh, uh, form of, uh, you know, of, of government in, in many ways. Uh, tributes, even in, in the vassalage, etc., were nothing but payoff, hush money. Uh, it was an extremely corrupt world, and it had always been. Never, never think that corruption is, uh, you know, a you know, if there is corruption, things necessarily decline. The, the Roman Empire, for instance, has always been corrupted from the beginning to the end, and this didn't prevent it to to rise to to you know to become the the, the, the most uh, uh, the, 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 the probably at least in Western perspective the greatest empire in history, but um, the the idea is that, especially in the Middle Ages, you have always to keep this in mind, as you have to understand what the relation between central power and the communities were, because basically the history of the whole Middle Ages is based exactly on this. A, sen a, a weak central authority, and a lots of communities that had o each own their own prerogatives, didn't want to give them up, who had naturally an interest to participate into this broader system of... Uh, this broader political system of, you know, for interests of, of various sorts, um, chiefly economical as always, and participating naturally also to uh, to military uh, expeditions to, to expand in the, the kingdom, etc. But everything was definitely much more bargained and 
um, very difficultly um, uh, organized in many ways. And if you look at the effort at of the um, of every single feudal monarchy in this time to, to centralize a, a little bit more, you can really understand it. C certain things simply couldn't be done because central authority was too weak and the communities didn't want to essentially to pay for the royal ambitions that were definitely, however, um, ha um, you know, tending towards centralization in a, also in a kind of uh, exclusive form. Um, I must say I'm, I'm not a fan proper n neither of centralization nor of decentralization. I think that in history um, there is a nes sort of optimum a uh, sort of uh, uh, necessary balance between the two things because you can't live in a fully you know anarchical way at the same time you can't you know just be controlled like in a totalitarian state so all of our all of the historical um, states uh, you know whatever they were even if there were these feudal states and people say well well these middle ages were no states well the, the state is a word you can use um, pretty flexibly. It state doesn't necessarily equate even linguistically to the nineteenth century nation state with you know, all the, the the maximum degree of centralization. State is a pretty vague term. It was introduced especially from the Renaissance, you know, also in a very different fashion the way that we use it today. So it per talking about state we can talk about about any form of political organization practically of some of a s even of an arbitrary degree of centralization. And remember that also in the here that every single power, every single society in history had a degree of centralization. Historically speaking, no human society has ever been fully anarchic. So when people tell you that in the Middle Ages there was no centralization, they're essentially um, blindly approximating um, such, uh, dif um, such a standard on the base of what, I don't know, modern history or contemporary history really was. So sometimes even mocking, haha, in the Middle Ages it was so weak because there was no central state. So the truth, this is false. There was a, um, at all times, even a, if you want in perspective, a consistent degree of centralization that naturally worked in very different ways. Um, and o even in paradoxical ways, especially in the feudal world, then naturally what happened especially in the contemporary history, because the modern state was really a hybrid between the two things. But also in here, also the medieval one was such, because uh, as long as also in here was a, a, a certain degree of mm, permanent, uh, a minimal of permanent bureaucracy of guards, of, of um, professional troops that at all times uh, in every single state kind of existed in certain measure. So even the idea, since we now we haven't been talking recently much about military history, I hope I will be able to, to do it soon once again. Um, but um, you, you often say things, oh, before the modern times there were no professional permanent armies. Well, also in here, it depends which standards you're taking, because d even during the Middle Ages, and, and even at very early times, there were s certain kind of permanent troops. Of course, they didn't make the whole army, not even a tiny part, but um, it still existed conceptually because conceptually it, it, there was still a, a tiny bit of centralization of sort to make things work otherwise uh, society would have been a, a nightmare um, I don't remember where I came uh, I got to, to talk in here oh yeah because of the communities of southern Italy well if you look at pre-Norman times you realize uh, southern Italy was extremely diverse mm -hmm. so um, mainland um, southern Italy so distinguishing it from Sicily, let's put this division, um, was Longobard. So these were um, essentially mm, Longobard principalities, at times only one, at times uh, more three or even more, telling the truth, that had essentially mm, survived and would survive up to the um, 11th century um, into... Um, into the southern, um, uh, into southern Italy, even after the fall of the Longobard Kingdom. So these were autonomous principalities that had carved their own, um, um, say, uh, space into between, actually between the Holy Roman Empire and the Byzantine Empire. So even playing quite interestingly in the 
international balance for the given to that. Um, um, mainland Southern Italy is a nightmare, strategically speaking. Ask you know the Allies during World War II. Ask it, it's um, a continuous. Uh, it's a heavily mountain terrain, full of wall, uh, valleys that every single time you have to uh, try to, to mm, you know to to storm uh, fortresses to 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 reach eventually. So these were lands that were actually many uh, armies from the Carolingians, the Byzantines um, and the, the Ottonians and other powers kind of tried to get into and always ultimately failing, maybe managing to, to arrive into a center, into a major center, and even taking it but you know, basically not having the, the resources to, to maintain it, to, to exercise their authority even in, in communities were pretty close, so actually a hell of a place. And uh, the Longobards had maintained, in fact, during this time, also a very strong identity in there. They um, they had their own law, their own Germanic law, they had their own... Um, uh, also qu quite interesting political culture, because from one side they, they, they kind of collected the legacy of the fallen Longobard kingdom, but from the other side these were territories that, since the very beginning, had received a, a, a much um, higher degree of, uh, of in, uh, a, a very high degree of, of um, influence from the Roman political models. In fact, it seems that the Longobards settled into s were settled by the Byzantines into southern Italy even before that the main long um, you know the, the, the Longobard people migrated from um, from uh, Pannonia into. Uh, from Hungary into uh, and Austria into uh, uh, into northern Italy, where they where they created actually the the larger kingdom. Um, so th there was a lot. It was its own. Um, the Longobards had their own liturgy, even their own script. Uh, just a few days ago, I was mm, hinting at it when discussing the literacy in early medieval Europe and the various differentiation and the various scripts. In uh, the various regions of uh, early medieval Europe, the Longobards had their own their own typization. Um, so this was one community, and this is incidentally, by the way, the community um, the within which the, the same Normans came to rise. Mm -hmm. You know that the Normans in in southern Italy rose to power as contractors. De facto, they were um, mercenaries who were hired by pilgrims who went to uh, the Holy Land. Um, in southern Italy, there were the, ma the main ports that brought you from, especially from Western Europe, into the the Holy Land. The the, the it's the, the Northmen had been fighting extensively into the Mediterranean, especially into the Byzantine army for from centuries. Um, so there was always this kind of guys everywhere. This I uh, think about even the. The video may, I was making on, um, uh, excuse me, I made on the Battle of Manzikert, seeing how there were Norman mercenaries even into Armenia this time. You know, it, they were literally everywhere. And in southern Italy, they, they kind of made money because, in fact, th there was this crossroad between west and, and east, and um, all the western pilgrims passed from there. So the, the Normans were uh, skilled uh, fighters and they began to, to sell their service to these communities. And looking at what the situation was, this is in a nutshell, of course, but looking at what the situation was in southern Italy, they were actually, first of all, the same Longobard principalities hired them as mercenaries. And this is very interesting. Because they, the Normans began to, um, the Oteville family, uh, eventually, um, that was originally from from Normandy. In fact, th 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 these were Frenchmen. Let's be honest about it. They weren't uh, Northmen anymore. These were, in fact, n of course, they were. By the way, the term Norman is extremely mixed. When you hear Norman, especially in this uh, time in the 11th century, they could literally be from everywhere. They, they didn't necessarily have to be from Normandy. They were just a group that was called like that because these Normans were quite, um, you know, there was a in fact, a, a Duchy of Normandy at this time. So they were identifiable in that this fashion, and naturally, what they were probably French. Uh, excuse me, they were prevalently French, but there were many others. I mean, if, even if you look at the Norman conquest of England, you realize that the Norman army was composed not just by Normans but also by uh, Bretons, uh, by uh, Flemish. So 
um, it, 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 Norman is a synecdoche to say, okay, these guys will come from North of Europe, but we don't really... There was no strict ethnical mm, definition of this. Some of the, these people came from other regions of Europe, so it's not really the point. So they began to be hired as mercenaries also by the Longbirds were fighting against each other this time because the main uh, Duchy of Benevent had basically split up into other powers like Capua and Salerno and these were continuously fighting one against the other so it's from this context from the same from the Longbird uh, world that the Normans rose to power into into uh, southern Italy and they began to, not like it happens actually in, in many times in history, that there are mercenaries who are extremely skilled at a certain point and managed to take control of the situation. And that's how in a nutshell it, it happened, but always being extremely um, engaged into the various um, local um, affairs and knowing perfectly the local communities, the balance that could change from one moment to another, and therefore acting primarily politically and only secondarily from a military point of view to, to obtain these goals. Because we have seen that nobody, even some of the most advanced armies of the time, had managed to seize southern Italy. So the Normans made it because simply they, they rose from the within. Hmm? Um, so this was one community just to tell you how varied eventually even the same subjects of the Sicilian kingdom were. Then on the uh, coastline of southern Italy there were many different um, um, essentially autonomous city ma maritime republics at this time. I'm saying autonomous because nominally they still belong to the Byzantine Empire. We're talking about centers like Naples, like uh, Gaeta, like other, mm, let's say, many principalities that had developed this, um, that were still close to the Byzantine world simply because they were open to the sea. And, and the sea at that point was um, still largely dominated by uh, the Byzantines. At least, well, during the 11th to 12th century now, it's also the western, in the, in the uh, central and northern um, Italian maritime republics were emerging like that. But even if you think about Venice, uh, it was essentially a part of the Byzantine Empire, um, and um, by name. Um, and, and these maritime republics that were telling you that the, the southern ones were, um, like take Amalfi for instance, was the first and most important at, at, at one time um, uh, Italian maritime republic emerged in fact from, from southern from southern Italy, from the Tyrrhenian coast in, in Campania. And um, and this this is because in, to southern Italy urbanism was actually um, more what was actually greater even than in the center and in the north by say Roman and Hellenic tradition. Uh, this that had kind of survived more in the, into these cities that were a bit even obliged to take the sea because uh, um, being, uh, as we have said, the southern uh, Italian mainland pretty rocky and mountainous, etc., and being the, and this city is having emerged actually in this quite hard pressed position between the mountains and the sea. Just take a month if you if you go there. It's a beautiful place, by the way. In vaca on vacations, I was there only once, but. Um, and at the whole uh, Amalfi coastline is, is extremely rich in history, and there is a lot of medieval history in there. So if you're interested, uh, I really advise you to, to go to visit these places, like, of course, together with Naples, with Gaeta, with all these centers that, in, in this sense, have a lot in common, from especially from that spe specific mm, time in history. Um, and, and, and these were cities that were formerly under Constantinople, but... Um, de facto were now pretty much independent and in fact they were rising as mercantile republics maritime republics that uh, were quite ver really quite powerful and the actually the same normans at a certain point struggled to manage to take these especially amalfi was the most powerful was extremely difficultly accessible from land there were lots of mountain passes it was a mess to to reach it and it was one of the last uh, of these cities to, to, to fall and um, we'll see now even what the relation between um, the Oatville and these cities was because it could be quite you know um, 
varied and telling the truth in um, depending on what essentially the political balance uh, really was and and these were communities that albeit um, say Italian in in prevalently they still had a, a very strong Hellenic influence uh, as a matter of fact Greek was still spoken quite uh, mm, quite widely into these areas the interland was fully it's a I don't know we would call it italic to to be more proper these cities had remained instead very close to Greece indeed with mindset and horizons and uh, chiefly because their main mar um, export markets now were, were there of, co of course now the mm, trade was shifting heavily also towards the the Muslim world especially um, after the uh, say that the Normans and the peasants and the Genoese basically um, wiped out the um, the Saracen presence into um, at, at least into the northern coasts you know, of the Mediterranean <coughs> and essentially starting doing <laughs> what especially the the Normans not so much actually but the the peasants and the Genoese actually doing Piracy on its own on on the African coasts, but even <laughs> on other ones, and successfully fighting against each other. The Normans weren't telling the truth that they had their own fleet, but they they never became an an extremely. Um, of course, they used fleets for military affairs, etc. They expanded their their power, but uh, at this time it was mainly the the. Um, maritime uh, republics of central and northern Italy it was kind of rising at the point of making more profitable for not just for the Normans of Sicily but also f eventually for the French and for the English even to and and um, and the Spanish to hire these um, these ships as mercenaries um, and to basically create their uh, given, given that there were no permanent fleets at this time it was cheaper sometimes to buy these um, these um, uh, to loan, let's say <laughs> these uh, sh um, galleys and crews of the uh, northern Italians that actually building your own fleet. That was something extremely costly, um, and uh, we'll get a bit more in detail to this later because objectively. Eventually, the Norman Sicily was still a feudal kingdom, so this feudal nature didn't make the Normans extremely keen on er anything that came from the commoners' world. So even if they actually owed their conquests of, of, of Sicily to the mm, logistics and, and um, uh, resources and manpower that these southern uh, cities actually were about, the, the, the Normans remained pretty much snobby, let's say, um, in the sense that they failed to be as knights, as full feudal knights, like the best mm, beings on earth. So not uh, differently from what uh, you know it could be in France or in England, for which the commoners and everybody who largely who fought on foot was basically a, a or permanently on foot was was nothing. It was it, uh, at the point of even of pseudo racial inferiority i mean th these people thought the the you know being a knight being of noble birth um, was you know equi essentially making you a, a different person than than other peasants were considered to be like half animals and stuff like that however um this meant that they never got fully engaged into the 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 maritime potential that southern italy had to offer uh but they were right in part because uh, there was a broader strategical need for this. It's not that it was a, a, a much of a cultural reason af after all. It was the problem that this, uh, the more um, cities were powerful and indeed um, they could rebel. So they didn't want to. And, and this is why these extremely promising rise of um, the uh, maritime republics in southern Italy was practically halted by the Normans and eventually uh, by the same Swabians and Angevins that definitely relied on the cities heavily because they were very important logistical centers they were but they tended not to let them too much um, power and eventually uh, historically speaking it was the 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 local aristocracy let's say the, the barons the the landed um, aristocracy that took over even the same cities and became this kind of uh, all controlling um, 
should say class in, into southern Italy. Um, this um, okay. So and and there were definitely regions that were much more intensely Greek sometimes in nature. Not necessarily, um, for instance, the city of Bari was Barian in in Greek, on, and the Apollonian coast was very heavily um, Byzantine. Definitely character. There were other regions of the southern, like the really the the tip of the heel of Italy that was extremely Greek in character. That there are still telling the truth in southern Italy and now communities that are distinguishing that speak a essentially um, a medieval Greek uh, tongue. Um, there are like twenty thousand. I don't know. Some, I don't know how I'm telling the truth. The and that, in fact, it's medieval Greek. It's not, uh, you know, that they they didn't get that language straight from the ancient times. It's it's when essentially the Byzantines were uh, now re-expanding to southern Italy because you know that the Byz we will have to talk about this sometimes. So how the Byzantines kind of made a bit back and forth into these centuries into southern Italy. How they also got rid of the Saracens largely. Um, they actually attempted to. Reconquer Sicily before the Normans and with Norman mercenaries, including, including um, uh, some of the guys who fought eventually at the Battle of Sanford Bridge, and um, you know, so this extremely mixed world from the north and the south of Europe and even beyond that, with that the Normans were kind of mastering the, their own way as um, as privateer uh, as contractors. Um, so, um, now it, it was very complicated, by the way, because there were certain free communities of uh, commoners into southern Italy that were, were in, in the more Greek-influenced lands were instead huge monasteries that were extremely powerful, uh, around which basically the uh, the the life of, of the local communities revolved uh, around. There were many Jewish communities, especially in cities like Naples, so into the urban centers, uh, there were large um, uh, Jewish uh, communities that also were extremely important in developing the trade between, at uh, this time, in, in earlier times, between um, the West and the East. Um, uh, so many languages uh, that also were spoken into southern Italy. And naturally, getting to Sicily, that was there had been an Arab uh, emirate. So in here there were actually the, the situation was quite mixed because there were certain kind of islands still of of Greek speaking communities also in here enormous monasteries of Orthodox tradition. Um, well, at this time the schism was basically happening in the 80s of the 11th century, but you know they, they had a Greek rite, let's say it better. Then Palermo was and eventually was to become the Norman capital. It was in fact the capital of. Uh, the Emirate of Sicily was a, a, a very um, large city for those time standards. It was mostly developing as a trade center, but also receiving the influences of, you know, Abbasid, Cal the Abbasid Caliphate in the east, um, the Caliphate of Cordoba in, in the west, especially in the west. It was a sort of western Mediterranean Islamic, um, uh, let's say, ensemble that uh, revolved around these centers of Sicily, uh, Tunisia, and 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 Spain, um, and and then also in here there was a um, essentially a Sicilian population that had remained um, Latin in tongue or at least uh, Romance language. That, telling the truth, at the beginning had extremely hard, uh, had been extremely resilient because they didn't want absolutely the Muslims to invade the uh, the island. So Sicily still actually maintained a Latin tongue at this time, but the, the main centers around the coast were definitely monopolized by, by the Arabs. Uh, but it was also in here a pretty multi-ethnic context. So it was an extremely diverse um, territory. Sicily in particular was extremely fragmented. And there were many people who think that Islamic Sicily was actually a very flourishing place. But mm, this is not really true. Um, I mean, sure, certain centers like Palermo were definitely important, but first of all, it, it, Palermo didn't control the whole island at all. Um, there were uh, there was a, a huge number of smaller um, Muslim lordship all over the Sicilian um, territory that 
um, actually didn't accomplish a great much. Um, this had begun because essentially when the Arabs had conquered the island, they had parceled the the land into into all these small groups of people. So they hadn't formed anything like a broader um, lordship with I don't know uh, a huge amount of public land or you know massive lordships with a lot of land. So when the Normans arrived, they actually didn't find any main power there that could obstacle them. Um, the conquest of Sicily took actually a long time because exactly because every single place had its own kind of fortress and its own lord and so the the conquest the Norman conquest of Sicily was an extremely long siege mm -hmm. um, but it it didn't present any extreme resistance mm -hmm. and eventually a great part of the Muslim population um, fled from Sicily in back into Tunisia. Uh, naturally, many Muslims remain as well, but let's say that also in here, even the myth of tolerance is um, sometimes we get pictures a bit too distorted um, in in many ways. Uh, naturally, the Arabs were quite useful for the Normans eventually as subjects as well, because many of these uh, communities that also we also in here Arab is a is an improper term because these people were not Arab; they were anything. Um, they were essentially Sicilians, first of all, um, that had been partly, definitely Arabized in, I don't know, in Tongue, also in, partly ethnically speaking, there were also certain groups that came, um, the Aglabids had invaded Sicily with s s several thousand um, black slaves, they, um, so here the whole thing was definitely quite mixed, but even the Normans now came with this kind of, uh, uh, Frankish, Danish, ethnic uh, element. So Sicily has this extremely varied history, um, and the. However, when we talk about Arabs, even and this is a point I was making just yesterday when talking about the cultural influence of medieval Islam, or in any other video I I, I made uh, I made about medieval Islam, the Arabs, you know, the guys who originally came from Arabia proper were actually diluted now they, they they had been an extremely small ethnic endemic um component uh, at this time these powers like the Aglabids of Tunisia that invaded Sicily were essentially local populations they were also very mixed because um you know um the Frikia was essentially this land that belonged to the, it was a berber population um a romanized population other compo i mean also here was quite mitigated um, by the way Europe influenced much more um, northern Africa than vice versa because there is also this kind of defensivistic myth of um, with a, where many people are obsessed by that at a certain point the, the Europeans kind of had to suffer constantly the, but uh, uh, the offensive of the Islamic war but telling the truth you know even from from a ca sheer cultural ethnical point of view, it was much more the Europeans who influenced North Africa, historically speaking, than, than vice versa. Uh, for sheer demonic macroscopical evidence, because obviously North Africa was never as, especially in uh, Northwest Africa, was never as demically powerful as Europe, um, especially Southern Europe. Um, but this, 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 now I'm digressing. The point I was making is that the Normans kind of took all of these elements to to greater extent and, and to and, and when we look at these um craftsmen who made these ex extraordinary um works uh, of art uh um, you know in, in into the in fact the Norman art uh, um it is often called Arab art, but it's it's Arab because it comes from models that were Arab. But telling the truth the local um, uh, um, the local um, um, employees, workers, and workforce, and artisans, craftsmen were now Sicilian essentially. So even the concept of Arab here it has to be a bit redimensioned uh, a bit, and just think that skill crafts have no ethnicity really. It's really. Uh, it re they really belong to those who are able to perform them um, and, and in fact if you look at uh, I was discussing this if you look at the past of Arab Sicily you realize that there, there is practically nothing remained 
from Arab times. You know, there are a few, uh, like a few walls, a few constructions that are remained from, from Arab times, but you can't objectively see what Arab Sicily really was. And this myth that Arab Sicily was so advanced, so happy, so florid, actually is being heavily really mentioned. Um, in recent times, not because not because now I know that there's plenty of people out there say, oh, because the Arabs were so uh, uh, I don't know they they have to be painted like I don't know what uh, devils on hurt. It is not the point. It's, it's simply a matter of resources. I mean, surely Palermo was extremely developed. It was one of the largest centers of of the Western world, but they um, there was never a centralized state that could achieve what I don't know what what in Cordoba was being achieved by the Omayyads um, or and eventually by the Almohads etc um, uh, I think even Tunisia were more centralized than Aglabit Tunisia was more centralized than Sicily definitely also because they were the ones who had conquered it incidentally but saying that this extreme development is pretty rare and I think that uh, I, I mean excuse me it's pretty difficult to assess and if there was someone, um, because this is the myth, people say, oh, well, the Normans had such a successful uh, kingdom into Sicily because um, they, they, they found already a very strong uh, Arab and uh, Byzantine administration. Hmm. Are, are we sure about this? Because uh, as far as I've seen, this is not, there is no really a great evidence for this. I mean, there is evidence definitely of the Norman bureaucracy taking titles and names and forms of government from the Arab definitely from the uh, in Byzantine traditions sure this is true but how much were these traditions developed before how much were these bureaucracies developed there is, uh, there is a very few telling truth to, to suggest the, the Normans drew heavily I mean from a strictly quantitatively point of view from pre-existing and administrative structures especially given the the um, as we've seen, that the local um, situation was so fragmented, politically speaking. Because let's be honest, even the, the Arabs were the one we, we have talked about this now. So this series of, of lordships that you know didn't have any, a very few c centralization overall all over the island, and maybe in Palermo it was a greater administration, but of course it was naturally, but was mostly trade based. There was no strong state apparently. The Byzantines ha were extremely influent into southern Italy as well, but where's the evidence they were they had major centers of administration in there? Sure, into places like Apulia, etc., there were certain centers that were ruled with local Byzantine administration and all. But I mean, these weren't huge centers; they weren't huge, um, they weren't huge infrastructures or things that you know. These were essentially lands at the outskirts of the empire, quite decentralized. That the Byzantines, by the way, had also in here relative trouble to to maintain. Uh, Byzantine power had ec eclipsed for several centuries in many areas. The Longobards had taken over many regions. So um, the uh, then the Saracens had ruled also into parts of southern mainland Italy. So the Byzantines reconquered everything, but then they had eventually to to get on uh, to an other front. So wh where was actually the continuity of this? So highly structured uh, Muslim and Byzantine uh, administrative tradition. I personally don't see it. You can't prove me wrong, naturally. But you know, pointing out th there are just names that are taken from the local administration doesn't mean that there was a that that administration was necessarily structured, because it's obvious that in any place there were names that were used to define I don't know a certain administrator. But this doesn't really give us the size quantitatively, uh, structurally, how this, these lands were developed. Um, and I'm saying this because actually the Norman Kingdom of Sicily was very, extremely developed, as we've seen from, from an administrative point of view. And what I'm say, trying to say in here, trying to suggest essentially, is that the Normans built that by themselves. Sh sure, drawing heavily from the local forms but not local size. This is the, the point I'm, I'm, I'm making. Um, and definitely um, the, the, the Normans were extraordinary, given this background, it took us almost one hour to, to draw, to 
reunite this all to create in Sicily, in the capital of Palermo, the fulcrum of a domin of a unitary domination that at the time didn't know anything comparable in the West, if not the uh, Norman Kingdom of England that in this sense was also pretty much well organized and I must say that the Norman Kingdom of England uh, was extremely developed also for one reason because the Anglo-Saxons actually had a very uh, advanced administrative system also in there nothing you know um, uh, you know resources were the ones that there were but definitely also in there the Normans were extremely clever to import feudalism just like they, they they eventually did in, in Sicily, but um, to also preserve the local administration that in England was particularly, uh, I can say centralized, but definitely for, for Frankish standards it was centralized, and therefore this allowed the Norman, um, uh, the uh, Anglo-Norman um, dynasty to to balance a little bit the powers of the barons, to make it more centralized, to have to form certain um, central um, institute and say other uh, uh, organs uh, you want to control better the the vassals and so on. Maybe I'm diminishing a little bit in this sense the the contribution of the of the pre-existing forms of administration to into southern Italy, but I personally have this opinion. I don't know. Uh, I repeat, if you if you can prove me wrong just do it because I'm here to learn myself so I'm not really um, so and this is a there, there is actually another reason why I do this is that very often and this this is with what I've I've begun telling the truth with the idea that I don't know the the local you know the, the Normans uh, the Norman kingdom was so successful because the local populations were used to be under um, foreign rulers like the Arabs and the Byzantines and they so they have this kind of Eastern mindset for which there's always a ruler over you and you have to obey uh, th this is probably the most stupid one, <laughs> one of the I don't know um, I don't know how it came out it definitely came out back I don't know why it came into the out into the 19th century um, to justify essentially why certain regions of Europe were more backwards more uh, stagnating from an economical point of view and saying well these guys were so used to that because they were exposed to eastern influences and so on but the success of the Norman kingdom goes far beyond this uh, as we have seen the local communities were not um, used to be controlled by a, a strong power at all um, and this from one side allowed the the Norman conquest, especially from a strictly military point of view, because there was no great power to counter the Norman invasion. But at the same time, it also created a lot of problems to the Norman uh, domination as well, because eventually, as, as much as, as centralized as this kingdom could be, the local communities were still pretty much autonomous and sometimes rebellious. There was especially a great um, hostility. I mean, Sicily was easily... Um, it was kind of easy to rule. It was mostly mainland Italy that was a pretty messy place to rule because geography doesn't change. Those communities have remained there into these mountain terrains, etc. And they rebelled very often also together with the same Norman barons that were there. So with this the centralized element eventually the Roman the, excuse me, not the Romans, but the Normans brought into the into southern Italy as well, from the Frankish Western Frankish tradition, French feudalism essentially. And, you know, great parts of the resources of the Kingdom of Sicily were spent to curb these rebellions. So it's not really this easy to, to, to depict, it's not really so simple. And, and it, it was really a very complicated thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, so... And, and even when comparing the uh, England and Sicily at this time as Norman kingdoms. Sicily stands out uh, by itself because it had one this extreme attention definitely towards the Eastern world. Mm -hmm. So looking at 
subtle and, and the prosecution of subtle experiences that definitely were of Eastern origin. And, uh, and as we've seen, probably not only from a strictly um, local way, but also looking at the rest of the Mediterranean. This is also often overlooked. I mean, as this time it was Spain, there was the Byzantine Empire. I mean, this, the Normans were projected into this world that definitely, even if wasn't exactly locally uh, so well structured, still had the sources of that political and administrative traditions pretty close, pretty even. You know, the Normans invaded Greece many times, uh, for instance, and they knew how things worked. They knew how the deal was. At this time, the 11th century, also the Islamic world was extremely advanced from uh, at an, a political and administrative point of view. The Normans went fighting, as we've seen, uh, practically everywhere, um, in, from you know from northern Europe to to the Middle East, um, it was uh, it was very easy to look at these models and, uh, and say, okay, let's try this, especially because now the Normans, and this is probably the most important point of view, that uh, there was no it it was paradoxically because of the local absence into southern Italy of this more. Um, um, of these strong political entities that um, that the Normans were able to to build from scratch this new administration, or at least definitely prosecuting the the, the structures that existed still there, but implementing them. So um, really um, giving a um, a stronger character to them, hmm? a more robust um, structure. Um, and this is interesting because definitely both the Muslim and the Byzantine um, administrative traditions were pretty much rationalized. Hmm? This is a bit the great difference between the Latin Germanic world and the uh, Byzantine and Islamic world, is that the Islamic world looked at uh, had grown essentially imitating the centralized saddle systems of Rome, I mean, the Byzantine Empire, and of Persia as well. So when the Arabs arrived, especially in two lands, that also in that case, uh, there is a bit of a similarity in here, even with the Romans, in, in places where there was definitely a strong saddle administration like if you take especially the east and the near east where there were the Byzantine um, um, you know th 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 that was part of the Byzantine Empire and they occupied those lands they continued the Roman tradition administrative tradition but also shaping their own but in places like Spain for instance that were all but centralized um, or at least they had a very weak political balance, I mean Visigothic Spain, and they built essentially their dominion in a more centralized fashion. Of course, well, the, the Emirate of Cordoba was um, mostly set in uh, Andalusia, so in, in the south of Spain where actually also the Byzantines had remained for a longer time, but was such an extremely far in the centralized center from Constantinople that who can say, oh, well, before the Arabs it was such a huge state in there that the, the Umayyads actually just inherited from the Roman tradition. What was there in Spain? It was nothing like that. So it's obvious they reshaped it on, on their own. And, and this is how the Normans, I believe, did the same thing. However, the important point here I was trying to make is that the um, Muslim powers stuck to a centralized model. So with a state, with a bureaucracy, with a professional army. The, uh, the Normans didn't even quite achieve this. Hmm? Let's still remember the word coming from Latin Germanic background, so not really from that strict administrative tradition. This could have the Norm the Secular Norman Kingdom might have been the most centralized on the whole Latin Germanic Europe, but still drew heavily from the same. Hmm? And especially from feudalism. So the, also this huge emphasis on centralization it has to be understood on definitely what existed before, 
also in part because of it, it could it could be built from scratch from the huge resources by the way that a country like Sicily could could give like Sicily at this time is extremely wealthy as a land I mean historically speaking Sicily has been one of the most fertile lands in Europe um, if not the most actually um, so at this time in the Middle Ages uh, all the exports I mean great part of Italy also was fed with the Sicilian grain uh, the uh, Sicilian grain was even exported into the Muslim lands, so that's why these guys were beginning to make a lot of money and to, to invest also in the, the strengthening of the bureaucracy. That in part surely already existed, but that definitely took a more unitary form in a in a in a kingdom like the Norman one. It was definitely unitary, as before it there was nothing unitary. So how can there be, uh, this is another point, how can there be such a big structured bureaucratic administration if what you have before the Norman kingdom is essentially of all a kind of a fragmented, a politically fragmented world? It, it, do you understand why I'm making this point? Because it doesn't make much sense. And there are, there are certain cliches that are not maybe completely wrong. Because there is always kind of, history is about always ba making this kind of balance. You know, between, okay, of course, if there is a theory... It's very, very difficult to wipe that out, as if it didn't exist, because hopefully that theory has been built on some evidence. But sometimes it maybe it's too much stress, too much emphasis, so you have to balance it back a little. And this is what I'm trying to do. So not denying the contribution that Muslim Byzantine administration forms had on the development of Normans. But uh, this was probably more as a genetic mold than actually a pre-existing massive stru material uh, presence of these... Uh, even of structures, mm -hmm. because let's be honest, the, the Normans also bought a freaking lot of things in terms of buildings, of administration, thinking about the, the the royal palace in in Palermo, all these beautiful cathedrals. Sure, part of them, you know, the cathedral of Palermo was a mosque before, for instance. But let's say that it was also the r reorganization of this world from scratch, which is very useful because. Differently from other kingdoms, like especially the post-Carolingian ones, that had su why did they have such a, a low degree of centralization while Sicily and England uh, had more? But it's obvious. It's obvious because in, in the post-Carolingian kingdoms, there had been the proliferation of, of all these smaller yet consistent powers, very, very well-rooted lordships, feudal lordships on, on, on this central European land, and Sicily and England didn't have that. They they came from different traditions. So that's when feudalism, that was still thought, however, as a winning model, and it definitely was, telling the truth, was exported into these lands. Because many people say, well, well you had the opportunity of having a non, uh, um, a non uh, say a non decentralized land. And you export feudalism, so you decentralize. But this is the answer. Because what existed before, even clearly, was not enough to make something strong. I mean, to have, think just about having military retinues. Mm -hmm. uh, you can have definitely a centralized administration with making, you know, with a, with a society that is based on, let's say, the, the middle class, the um, small uh, and medium uh, property owners. That form that can form the the bulk of a of a local militia, let's say. But is that so strong? This is the age of feudalism. Heavy cavalry is rocketing to the stars now. Um, that's the thing that that works best. And the Normans were also in here the, some of the best cavalrymen out there. Not the best, because this is another cliche. And we'll have time to to see it in other context because the Normans were nothing but an exact copy of the French of the Western Frankish cavalry at this time. So people said, oh the Normans were the greatest knights. Mm, how? Knights at this time into the feudal world was all, were all alike. So the the, the, the Normans uh, the Norman knights weren't any better or any worse than uh, a French knight, for instance. Uh, they were an exact copy of it. Also because their society was an exact copy of the of the French one. So, <laughs> what's the what's the point here? Th th this is very important to understand. Uh, 
But the idea answer to the question is why exporting a decentralized model into a land that is so well centralized? Be well, because even if that land was not so well centralized, first of all. Secondly, these um, normal uh, overlords needed still their military retinues to make war. Mm. And the Norman Kingdom of Sicily was extremely aggressive, mm. especially towards the Byzantine Empire. It went as far as as uh, Thessalonica, it, it, it invaded Epirus, it, it was an extremely aggressive thing, and this was done through the famed Norman cavalry that was f uh, fueled in this sense by the, by the feudal system, the feudal retinues that were um, gra um, uh, exported, in fact, also into Sicily. So, you don't have to think feudalism in this sense is the is something negative or antithetic or something you should prefer uh, you shouldn't prefer over a centralized system because feudalism was also a very gluing um, system into the political unity of a kingdom and that's why the Normans exported it into southern Italy the Normans into southern Italy according to me were amazing uh, in terms of political and administrative models, they, they understood perfectly what they had to do. They immediately bonded, they immediately see. And the first thing what they did, actually, was not much to shape this bureaucracy and all that was also in there, something progressively built, um, telling the truth. Um, but it was indeed to seize the land, uh -huh. which didn't mean, well, it was very complex, because if you go look in detail and how this happened, also in here they didn't actually wipe out the local resources because that was impossible to they would have requested an, an enormous quantity of resources mm -hmm. they rather seized definitely and they had to fight also to conquer these these lands so they definitely wiped out part of the local resources but sometimes they simply blended in and there were areas of frontier in the same in the same kingdom if you look at the um you know, the Normans expand uh, into uh, mainland Italy, uh, didn't occupy just southern, but also parts of, of, of central Italy, especially in the southeast of central Italy. Um, and these were sometimes areas of frontier. There was there, there was a decentralized government, so local cities or, or, or lords, etc., were kind of co-opted into the Norman domination. And it was mostly the most fertile areas, like Apulia, chiefly, was extremely fertile. Um, extremely rich was seized mm. so to make uh, these huge uh, est feudal estates to provide for the, the bulk of heavy cavalry etc. In Sicily definitely as well. The Sicily was much easier to control as we've seen than, than southern Italy. So I Sicily actually remained the bulk of the kingdom also in moments when there was a time in to the 12th century to w in which the Byzantines basically managed to reconquer all of southern mainland Italy for like w a few months actually but eventually they were overthrown the, the, the wall invasion failed but just for saying here that you have to look at the economical geography of these lands and you have to understand how they really work in terms of sheer amount of resources and the core of the empire was uh, of the kingdom was definitely Sicily. I'm, I'm keeping saying empire because objectively eventually Sicula, the Sicula Norman Kingdom was kind of a, of an imperial in fashion. Um, that's what I explained into that video on Norman Sicily. I mean the, the Normans extended their control also on the uh, coasts of Tunisia and Libya. They created the Principality of Antioch into the uh, Outremer uh, states or the Crusades they launched this extremely um, uh, dangerous offensives on I into uh, to the very heart of the Byzantine Empire. Their dream was actually to capture Constantinople, as it was the dream of a anyone who ruled into southern Italy, to be honest, with the Swabians, the Angevins, etc. Um, so, let's just reflect what this kingdom really was and ju let's not just concentrate on the fact oh look at this the the local legacy of the previous administration because the political practice and military practice mm -hmm. the strategical thinking of these people were was concentrated on, on, on very different premises mm -hmm. it's obvious for us to look as moderns and thinks oh look at these guys had a more centralized uh, system than um, than other countries at the time into into the West that was pretty much decentralized. Yes, this is something I, al I also 
tell every time because I hope it's I think it's it's like it's like a catchphrase to 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 get you a bit more interested about Norman Sicily but um the some the, the, this is just a, f a formal aspect it definitely also informed the the rest of the domination but uh, sometimes here the essentials are a bit simpler than the, what they seem so we don't have to be ex so extremely Machiavellic in thinking on how and why, you know, certain things happen, but really looking at the sheer needs that these powers had at the time. So definitely a, a centralized administration was useful to control the kingdom, but how this balance really worked in the in the in the bigger perspective is really trying to keep the local communities satisfied to balance their own power this is right like the abc of 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 political practice especially in the middle ages there was no other way to rule in there even if with all these uh, muslim uh, byzantine bureaucracy models etc that's not the key through which you could control all these lands there, there had to be other means and definitely feudalism was one of them because it allowed to have a a point of reference. This is also very important. Just think if the Roman Normans had not exported um, feudalism, how could they control certain lands into southern Italy? Because feudalism is essentially putting a guy in charge of a huge amount of land mm -hmm. that has to... Um, that is your reference. As you say, every time you have to move an army, I don't have to ask every single guy to, to move. I have to ask these major barons I have, so that they send me taught, let's say, uh, troops from hundreds of cavalrymen from Apulia, hundreds of cavalrymen from... By the way, the, the Kingdom of Sicily at this time had, I think, on paper, at least, because we have the um, the documents of relatively to record made in administration, had probably the strongest military in Europe. Uh, at least in terms of in a feudal Europe, the, the highest number of knights was, I think, the one in Sicily. Although this is on paper, because it's extremely difficult to, to in the first place, to pretend to assess the uh, the real um, power of a uh, you know manpower of feudal kingdom, because these were all theoretical. You know, how do we have these numbers? But essentially. The land was parceled in a way that, in fact, I I in this bureaucracy helped of knowing how every single land of the kingdom was, uh, you know, capable of providing a certain amount of troops, and so by law technically this happened. But this was purely a numeric. Uh, th this happened also in the kingdom of England, in other kingdoms, etc. Um, but it was something highly theoretical in many ways because definitely the armies that could be drawn were also much. Uh, were always much smaller, uh, and and by the way, that the, there were factors that could change. I mean, if there was a famine, if the the harvest did didn't go well, there was a s I don't know some climate. Did, you might have not had enough resources for launching massive uh, military operations for I don't know for 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 years. Uh, so these val numbers were definitely floating, and there were just a Sometimes not even conceived for recruitment, but just for, you know, giving money. This was uh, an easy thing to do. That is, um, how did bureaucracy help in this? Because aside from feudalism, the land was still parceled in uh, essentially tax, uh, taxation districts. So that there was a sort of um, uh, census that worked in the sense you had to pay uh resources and and those resources were actually even more important than the uh, than than sending every single person to to fight from that district um because um as we've seen there were no resources to to mobilize everyone so it 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 just took to have a enough resources to 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 have that critical mass of troops you could of heavy cavalrymen you could use uh, for launching massive operations, and and the rest of the communities were just left to contribute with with um, with money or or their equivalent, not with people. Mm. 
not necessarily this was the average pretty much everywhere in the, this time um, however also we will I will surely have to I will surely make a video on the or, uh, military organization of the Norman Kingdom of Sicily as well for any other kingdom in Europe and, um, and look a bit more in detail to this because as we were saying before uh, um, however a very overlooked component of the Cyclo Norman army was actually um, the one provided by the cities. Mm -hmm. The cities um, were stamped, as we've seen in their growth, by the Normans, but up to a certain point, because so th they could also be useful, they could also produce resources like ships, chiefly in a Mediterranean kingdom, is pretty much uh, necessary. Excuse me, I drink a little. But Borum in general, also those craftsmen that were so useful in into siege warfare. Mm -hmm. So, um, in a world like the high medieval Europe, where especially uh, siege warfare was and uh, siege technology was rapidly um, um, evolving, and definitely these um, uh, urban classes were very very important because they brought all the uh, the skills the the tools the uh, the the mate uh, material also to to perform sir, to to build up to make a blockade to to, to besiege a town etc and this is interesting because um, eventually the Norman kingdom of Sicily trans uh, kept evolving as a feudal kingdom as we have seen so this on the long run definitely stemmed the the productivity of the local cities, uh, and that's why central and northern Italy surpassed essentially uh, the south, all in technological terms. In fact, when we talk about figures like Frederick II, we like to stress, uh, so in the 13th century, we like to stress that the, um, I don't know, the, that since he was such a, uh, he was a man of science and, he, uh, and, 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 and his mm, the court of Palermo was so advanced uh, scientifically, technologically speaking. We assume, as moderns, that there was a sort of know-how that uh, spread in as a fallout, and, and the rest of the kingdom, and magically, they, these guys could have the most advanced technology. This is not how technology works, uh, historically speaking, and and even the great uh, the great military might of this kingdom of Sicily, even during the fa the wars between Frederick II and the Lombard League, etc., is. It's been a bit overinflated uh, at that point. I mean, it was definitely a very strong kingdom, then, uh, but it was strong mostly for its feudal cavalry, or at the time also for mercenaries that could be, were kind of substituting the feudal levies. So also with a progressive decline of sir, of the um, early uh, Norman uh, recruitment system was, as we've seen, pretty efficient, and especially the the major advancements in Europe at the time in siege engine, military technology, etc. were all experimented in Lombardy, into northern Italy, not into centers like Sicily or not even other feudal kingdoms. Um, because the the resources, the, the, the skills, the, the tools, the materials were needed were to be found mostly in the communal uh, world, not in the feudal one. Hmm? And this is why even uh, you know, this brought eventually to, can say on the long run, looking, taking a long shot to, to the Renaissance, because objectively, it, the Renaissance emerged not from feudal kingdoms, but from these kind of city republics that were constantly fighting on their own, etc., but still, in fact, developing individually something more... Um, more dynamic, but anyway, it was we're extremely wealthy places as well, so it's also a matter of resources, telling the truth. But for saying that, um, in order to 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 have certain resources, you also have to have some 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 structure, some basis. When the southern cities declined, definitely the 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 kingdom of Sicily lost this kind of dynamism that had kind of characterized it at the beginning, and had to rely essentially on external. Uh, forces like at this time it was mostly the Genoese, uh, the the peasants that provided the the ships for for the kingdom uh, under the Swabians under the Angevins, for instance. The same goes for the Byzantine Empire. The Byzantine Empire had this huge potential, especially in early medieval times, and it grew to be a sort of a crystallized society, 
So the great fleet of uh, Constantinople that had uh, been like the guard of the Mediterranean for centuries eventually declines. They didn't have even have the resources, they didn't have the the, cla the urban classes for keeping that up because it was mostly a political balance. And what they do? They begin to hire the Venetians that now had the best, the most advanced fleet in the Mediterranean. Um, so this is a bit how even you know you waste part of your potential. Um, even though th not everything is lost, because even in the mm, feudal world you can definitely develop certain uh, structures that are pretty good. I, I mean, for instance, the Kingdom of Sicily, with all the problems it had, it's still during the Angevins and, and the Aragonese, was still like a power to be reckoned with. It was one of the strongest uh, kingdoms in Europe uh, up to, you know, it's still the end of the Middle Ages, so it's... it's um, it's really a mix, a very complex mix, maybe we'll go into detail some, some other time, of various, let's say, um, contributors that all have to, however, are political agents, are political, let's say, um, actors you have to to deal with, so it's something extremely unstable, and arguably the whole history of these kingdoms revolved around this negotiation, this bargaining, hmm. uh, in many ways. Um, so, the so we were saying to, to be a bit more specific relatively to which which kind of an administrative traditions we we're talking about, definitely. In Sicily, there was a an emerald um, system that had been working chiefly in the northwest of the island. That uh, surely had its own recruitment system and so on. So, not really anything um, was not about. Th these were probably uh, mostly issued for the, the living militias and so on local militias, but nothing extremely consistent, I believe. Um, probably the bureaucratic and military um, customs of um, Byzantine, Apulia and Calabria were, in, in, uh, and the ones of the Campanian cities were a bit more consistent. Also in here, because um, mm, for different traditions, um, also in here, there was nothing like feudalism, for instance, being uh, pre-existing the Normans into uh, into these regions. There were certain local militias, definitely some had to serve on horseback, even heavy cavalry and so on, but um, I don't think there was anything really strictly professional. I mean, there was definitely a bulk of, mm, let's say, of, of um, especially of the, aristocra the aristocrats that had its own mounted elite, and that was probably also growing similar into to to the feudal models because I have this at least I read history as if in spite of what the Franks accomplished in forming the Vassalatic beneficiary system and and feudalism eventually a bit of the rest of Europe was heading towards that direction I mean the the crisis of the Freemans, Germanic Freemans class uh, in into the early medieval times in um, passing to high medieval times it's pretty evident. It's a it's a normal trend. It's actually something that happens in all kind of sanitary societies, unless there is not a uh, rocketing factor like an extreme commercial expansion or, or, or an industrial revolution, like it would happen. In fact, but that kind of brings more political egal uh, egalitarianism in. But in these pre-industrial times, you know, there is no really anything like that. And objectively, the local aristocracies were growing uh, pretty much, but there is still, and this is very important to understand, a, a huge, um, massive quantitative difference between the feudal, you know, the Frankish feudalism and these other uh, areas. Like, if you want, even England, or even Scandinavia, or even Germany, or even Southern Italy, or even the Slavic countries, or even Spain, had this kind of elite. But they didn't have such you know such individual noble didn't have the huge amount of land that the Frankish model entailed. Hmm. 
So that even the, the, the spreading of mounted combat and the mounted elite into Europe at this time is something that went in parallel with certain models of political and social transformations occurring to those uh, peoples that basically brought the elite to become always richer and the commoners to become all poorer so that they could all work for maintaining the elite and providing that with um, with big resources were enough to have a, an armored uh, gear, uh, a war horse, uh, the resources for training all their life long with, with this and this is what the Normans essentially export into here so the the, the local recruitment system, recruitment system that could exist into Byzantine Italy at this time could have been definitely functional there were militias that were raised, there were surely also heavier troops etc but it wasn't anything so massively oriented towards professionalism like instead was in a nutshell the um, the Frankish feudalism that the Normans imported um, there, is a, there was also a, a, a very big emphasis the, the Normans placed on the, uh, the Oteville dynasty actually put in itself um, at the court at the royal court of Palermo. It was celebrated as a enormously powerful um, milieu in many ways. And naturally there was a lot of religious symbolism, uh, a lot of political um, propaganda touched um, and they... I haven't never been very much into this thing but I, I suspect that the the Normans were kind of very um, in this sense very attracted by the eastern political models especially the one of of, of, um, of Constantinople um, so this universalistic symbol like the Normans didn't make it in, into the history of Europe to become this kind of Caesar or papistic power they like like mm, it's um now it's complex because I should open a, uh, another very powerful digression however the point I was my was making is that in many parts of the Mediterranean and this happened since the migration era telling the truth these um northern powers let's say these western powers of Romano-Germanic Europe always looked at places like Constantinople, like even the the Islamic Caliphates, and even as far as Persia, per, uh, even if a bit less, to stress their own political prerogatives as monarchs. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look, for instance, what the Visigoths were doing in Spain, well, these were essentially reshaping their court on the models of Constantinople. Even in Anglo-Saxon England you find certain kings who appointed themselves as Basileus, so the same imperial title of Byzantium. The, the Normans arriving into Sicily, they, they said, okay, let's draw these models as well to concentrate our own, uh, say, to, to augment our prerogatives. I mean, this, the Oteville dynasties were essentially a band of mercenaries, nothing else. They didn't have any... they rose really through that. So they... the problem now was, you know, you had the opportunity to to rule over these newly conquered territories where there was basically no center of opposition, at least especially in Sicily. So what do you do? Do you stick... what, what models do you want to... obviously you choose grandiose um, um, political models. You definitely want to think that God has placed you here, that you have to show your might to all your subjects. And this was reinforced particularly by the fact that the Normans were ruling in Sicily on behalf of the Pope. Um, obviously the reality was a bit more um, uh, say, less idyllic um, but indeed, the Norman Kingdom of Sicily had been born as a vassal state of Rome. 
um, the popes had basically granted the kingship of Sicily to um, uh, to the Oteville even before that Sicily was conquered so when Sicily was still Muslim so it was essentially a uh, sort of uh, of carrot <laughs> like saying okay just go conquer Sicily and uh, I'll give you the title of king here there are uh, there is all another chapter of medieval history that is relation between the papacy and the um, Sicilian lands because the when Sicily was still Byzantine before the Muslim conquest the 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 popes had a huge and I mean a huge quantity of estates into Sicily partly also in the rest of north of, of southern Italy and in Sicily definitely had been the granary of Rome hmm? so by the way when the when the Arabs had seized Sicily Rome also kind of uh, the popes kind of started to make a more of a kind of continental politics also taking much deeper roots into central Italy as they co the core of their uh, domains because they had lost uh, Sicily and they had lost the grain supplies so even the city suffered because of, so they had to search for other directions this arguably also um, favored you know looking at the Franks instead of the Byzantines at a certain point so the great dreams of the and, and by the way the Byzantines had been uh, you know theoretically these lands belonged to into Italy belonged to them or to the Empire and naturally the the Pope instead wanted to, to seize these things for for um, for himself uh, at all times like even to the Carolingians the Popes all asked to, to control like the whole Italian peninsula um, up to the Adige River and um, so at this point the, the, the Popes had this um, massive opportunity to exploit the Normans the telling truth had been also a pain in the behind um, up to that point it, the Normans famously at the Battle of Civitate made it managed to, to kidnap the Pope Leo the I mean it was a pretty uh, the Normans came to to sack Rome at a certain point into 11th century as well um, but nevertheless in spite of this troubled relation the Popes kind of managed to to frame the Normans into their own Dominion in some way, um, which the Oteville at a certain point understood to be a, as a very proud of profitable, profitable thing because uh, being vassals of the papacy could have been demanding politically speaking, but at the same time it had a freaking lot of of um, um, of advantages. Chiefly, the fact that they could be backed by the uh, Roman Church against the Byzantines, which was not uh, a very uh, was very important indeed, as a given the uh, the strategical interests of the Normans in the Mediterranean. Um, um, I forgot what 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 is the point. Um, so yeah, I mean to to the ends of the political the the secular Norman political propaganda definitely. Um, they weren't just like a kingdom like another. They were vassals of the papacy. So in theory, they were kind of the best. And this, actually, I don't know how much it was stressed eventually in the, in the over time. But it was definitely something important that also had... It, 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 there was a tradition that arguably continued. Think about you know, Frederick II who was adopted as the perfect son of the church by, uh, by Innocent uh, III. Uh, think about all the relations. There were certain... Papal enclaves also into southern Italy. For instance, Benevent, that had been this last amipost of the Longobards at one point, instead of falling into the hands of the Normans, they handed themselves to the papacy, saying, "Okay, we prefer to stay under Rome." And in fact, Benevent remained this um, uh, enclave in the uh, in the uh, in, into the southern kingdom, just like I don't know, it could be Avignon, uh, the borders of the Holy Roman Empire in France, in the in Provence. Um, historically, and, and the king even later to modern contemporary times, it's like the the kingdom of Sicily or the two Sicilies, as it was called afterwards, kind of had this privileged relation with the papacy being kind of the most holy. You know, even the church had a, a huge power into into uh, 
up to the, to the 19th century into southern elite it's um it's very complicated stories now but uh, to make the long story short also here there was a an, a huge aggrandizement propagandistic aggrandizement of the same um Oteville dynasty in as as a royal dynasty into Sicily uh, and this is pretty obvious because you're, they were essentially legitimating their own rule on the basis of religious prestige and, and so on. And there are these beautiful um, ca- um, churches and into um, into Sicily that were built by the Normans. That uh, you can see how how inf- uh, how influent was Arab and Byzantine um, art into them that glorified the the figure of, of definitely of Christ in this enormous encompassing you know, uh, power that entrusted essentially the the Oteville, uh the power on those lands and this um, will imp- went in parallel with that process we were discussing before that has to do with the also the degree of institutional centralization that the Normans were developing mm-hmm. um, and uh, in fact the same court of Palermo, the same Norman bureaucracy was uh, structured in a fashion that were obstentating the um, Arab and Greek titles together with the Western ones because definitely the, the Normans brought also their own French um, um, titles and uh, especially in the military as you can imagine um, and they the, the, sec- the Hauteville put a lot of, uh, of emphasis also on the uh, functionaries of uh, of the state. I mean, their their prestige, even in, in parallel, you know, to counterbalance the power of the nobility. So these figures that were kind of uh, referent to a model, uh, excuse me, to a central model, to a cer- central structures, and they, in parallel with this, as we've seen, also they the Normans structured a very efficient tax system. Mm-hmm. Uh, they also had a very um, developed um, legislative um, system in a very um, um, in, in a very direct control of the ecclesiastical apparatus. Mm-hmm. So all these factors reveal actually a pretty strong, a pretty marked um, monarchic uh, orientation. Mm-hmm. So having essentially a body of central institutions that keep under control the territory through taxation, who act, uh, say, directly from the central government, as this, all these functionaries uh, did, and also keeping an eye on the church. Mm-hmm. So also here in direct um, control with Rome so that the local ecclesiastical lordships wouldn't develop like in other countries like, I don't know, Germany where they kind of started to do what, it, what the hell they liked. And this was the, the u- it really, you know, it probably doesn't say uh, sound anything excessively special to your ears. I don't know what... But you have just to think that this was an incredible system at the time because nobody had achieved that in Latin Germanic Europe. There was no such a solid control. And that's why also the Normans were... uh, You know, there was interest not just of the Normans but also of the Church of Rome to let this happen. Because naturally the Church of Rome had certain problems to to keep... uh, Obedient, the various uh, ecclesiastical hierarchies of the rest of Europe. So through the Norman Kingdom, actually, they could have a very strong, very um, direct uh, control over the local church. Mm-hmm. Also, here naturally were contrasts, attritions, and it was nothing so smooth. But uh, what is impressive is how the system turned out in terms of centralization. Nobody had that. Not even the Kingdom of England at this time. It was amazing, and and this conferred to the Normans a huge power in the south, and which allowed them to to expand and to you know to be so aggressive, also strategically speaking, into the Mediterranean theater. Um, however, 
given the solid power of this monarchy, we don't still have to think, and this is also very important to stress, that we're talking about extremely rigorously um, uniformed um, bureaucratic um, systems. Hmm? Because the Oatville, in their very long conquest, had had to bargain with the cities, hmm? uh, granting local mm, customs and autonomies uh, in the government. And even though if they didn't respect that uh, all the time, and therefore, and, and also, by the way, they had granted, confirmed or granted, it depends, uh, the um, immunities to the ecclesiastical entities. Mm -hmm. The papacy had asked for it. And especially they had built also their own um, feudal and vassalatic institutions mm -hmm. to create that net of military Loyalties connect with the exercise of seigneurial rights that were essentially the same ones that existed were spreading in the rest of the West. Mm -hmm. So this is very important because it shows you that um, also the the needs of of these monarchies. I mean, the the, the world these the world communities of the, the kingdom could not be controlled even not even by a such a structured monarchical um, apparatus if they there hadn't been a, a, a certain degree of political bargaining and the variety of the local communities um, the diversity of the local communities definitely contributed to to form this balance in a way because the the Oatville could turn like these communities like one against the other they could balance them more easily given that there were so many actors from one side, naturally, it was more complicated, but from from the other side, it was um, easier to, you know, kind of um, use other actors to to same other actors. Um, so the cities naturally had that that uh, as we've seen now were used to be very autonomous into southern Italy were maintained with certain resources. Even the fall of certain maritime republics took really a lot of time. It was something that happened not because the Normans arrived and uh, repressed everything, but anything, if anything because now the, the Normans yeah, they granted autonomies to them once they captured, the, they, they subdued them, but um, without being ex extremely oppressive th but this was enough to make these maritime um, city republics to lose the, um, the competition with the other ones that were developing outside of the Secular Norman Kingdom. Um, in other case, on other occasions, definitely the the Normans were able to to also export their um, the uh, let's say the, let's say to to mm, to infringe the uh, the concessions that had been done to certain local communities because they they progressively came to structure their power more more consistently and therefore managing to curb some mm, prerogatives that had initially needed to lead to certain communities the norman dominion could be also pretty harsh for instance when in the, i mean in 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 repression but that now I want to make this example that is the Byzantine invasion of Apulia in, in the se seventh, uh, excuse me, in the twelfth century. After this episode that had succeeded, not much because of Byzantine force, but actually because of the, in fact, of the large autonomy that existed in the local uh, Norman barons that wanted to get rid of the Sicilian um, rule, um, the the Oatville raised to the ground the city of Bari. Mm -hmm. So they slaughtered, they kind of maintained up just a cathedral, I think. Or maybe they destroyed even, I don't remember. Um, but just for saying also that this myth that the local populations were used to be governed by a Byzantine Saracen tradition, where? These guys wanted to remain autonomous. And that's what they, they kind of managed to do. Uh, especially 
given the rise of the local aristocracies but even before so all these obedience of the uh, local population by tradition of eastern influence where is this um, and that's really something it, it's difficult to to make I mean Roger the second had to fight like um, I mean in the, even because this is the point think about medieval logistics think about medieval technology how can you think about having to besiege a city it, it's a huge cost so you you can't necessarily in go with iron fist because you're gonna go bankrupt immediately you have to bargain you have to negotiate mm -hmm. so this is how this kingdom was put together like any other kingdom at the time the only difference is this one was put together better <laughs> than the others so this is in a nutshell how it worked um, naturally as we've seen also the church was gaining um, the church was now the privileged uh, community in the, the most privileged one in, in the sense that the Normans had to be obedient to the Pope so not messing up excessively with the ecclesiastical affairs and this contributed to develop also certain ecclesiastical um, powers that however were still framed into the into the local dominion and this was very important because um, the same popes didn't as we've said before didn't want these ecclesiastics to, to get too powerful on their own just wanted to to basically to have a direct access to those estates and not to let it you know fall neither into the hands of two um, autonomous ecclesiastical lords nor to be too directly controlled by the Normans also in here as we've seen the uh, the the relations between the Normans and the papacy were strained at uh, some time so this could really work pretty Another very important thing we named was the legislative uh, activity of the Kingdom of Sicily. Now, the Kingdom of Sicily at this time had was still kind of developing its own juridical, the, the juridical progress of the monarchy. The peak would be reached, uh, however, th there was a balance in here that, uh, so as all, all feudal monarchies at the time, the the uh, legitimization of the mo uh, of of the rule was based on of the monarchic rule was based on the on the concept that the um the monarch was there essentially exclusively to defend the um the communities and to especially to preserve also their uh their customs mm -hmm. the local prerogatives so everything that concerned really the the customary laws that already existed. This is a nutshell how feudalism worked and how it really was in, the, in terms of um, uh, the uh, of of how communities were e eager t to accept a, a ruler. Now, Na naturally, this happened many times without a um, a real. You know, it was a very harsh negotiation many times but it was the usual it was like the the average uh, political theory uh, like actually the standard political theory at this time that had emerged to the chiefly to the Frankish feudalism and so the idea that uh, you know that being in, in a world where the central authority had been strongly undermined in post Carolingian times and therefore had kind of grown um, uh, kind of um, they, ac and they had accepted the existence of certain local prerogatives that couldn't be touched now in the in kingdom of Sicily as we have seen this these lordships ha had not essentially existed before so it was easy relatively easy for the uh, Normans to extend let's say their control in a more direct fashion over these communities um, this this sounds much uh, easier than in fact it actually was but let's say that 
all these factors, all these centralized um, character of the Sikro Norman state that we have seen brought, especially in the juridical practice, to make the Sikro Norman kings grow essentially more confident of their prerogatives. And this wouldn't happen in Norman times, but under Frederick II, the, um, uh, with the constitutions of uh, Melfi, that for the first and unique time in feudal history, mm, the king um, basically emanated a law that stated essentially that the king could create new laws to impose eventually uh, in the case of a um, exclusively however of a um, gap essentially a um, essentially uh, to to compensate for to to um, to create laws for mm, cases that that were not disciplined by law. Mm -hmm. So this was very important because is in the rest of Western Europe it was nothing like this. And the king had s was there simply to respect the right of the communities, nothing else, not to create other laws. Mm -hmm. Laws could be created, but only if the communities were agreed with that. You know, only if they agreed. In the Kingdom of Sicily, this was surpassed, for which the king legislated that he could basically create other laws, including this one, <laughs> by the way, through which he could formulate uh, and extend um, his his legislation as long as there were certain gaps in in law that had to be um, covered in some way to to. With obviously we, with the ultimate aim of delivering justice, that was the main, definitely the main objective of of the king in this sense, and the raison d'être of the monarchy in the first place. So that obviously power still derived from the, uh, at least the the poli in political practice from the um, acceptance of the communities. Obviously, the kings, the monarchs always prefer to stress that this power derived from God mm -hmm. and the old people also were stressing this and because in the constitutions of Melfi this is um, explained as well, uh, ex excuse me um, this is expressed as well um, the the interesting part of this is however that the this powers were so the the, the uh, in this case we are still at the time of this uh, already at the time of the Swabians so the Normans have finished as such but the kingdom was practically the same and still functioning on the institutional basis that the Normans had um, had created um, but uh, it was essentially in fact the same Norman tradition mm -hmm. and it reflected this high degree of centralization that the the Normans had managed to achieve or at least to put the premises for expanding even into the legislative side and surpassing basically all the other European political theory and institution at least in, in, in the West um, to accept that th the king could formulate laws on th obviously you can't fail but to recognize this was also Byzantine influence because in the Byzantine world basically the emperor could formulate every single law he wanted so he had this legislative power conferred directly from God and this is what even in a feudal mm, context the Normans were trying to impose given the the counterbalance and say um, that uh, existed institutionally at this point so that they had enough central power to kind of make this such a regulation accepted into the kingdom um, then there weren't actually many chances to um, this law, I mean, to be accepted into the kingdom. There were, there were many, probably many um, um, occasions in, to which this actually brought to a law that was 
you know, firmly imposed by the king on, on the kingdom as if, you know, uh, nothing. But this is important because it still put the premises for uh, a certain political um, predisposition to such events to happen. This is this happened in similar ways also in other countries. For instance in, in but never quite in with this institutional premise, with this legal acceptance. For instance in the Kingdom of France that was the perfect example, the, the per perfect standards standard of the um uh, seigneurial uh, theory of uh, say the seigneurial um, justification of the royal title, so this idea that the, the monarch had essentially to, to defend the communities and nothing else was much more oriented, being a much stronger kingdom in political practice um, to accept the king to, to impose other laws, but this still happened because eventually it was the assembly of the um, you know the uh, the French states that accepted this. Mm -hmm. Frederick II went past this. Okay, the, he could create in the case of a, a juridical gap a law that could compensate for it. This is important in the history of um, of medieval law. Um, so, just in conclusion, uh, all these centralization it was extraordinary came from the equilibrium between the royal control of the local forces hmm, which together with the solidarity of the conquerors in front of the subdued populations represented the uh, the comparable element with the fortune of, of the vassalage and of the fief uh, in Norman England, mm -hmm. the only comparable, um, let's say, uh, equal. And this is not um, obviously uh, by surprise w uh, happening in, in two Norman kingdoms. Mm -hmm. So kingdoms that had, in this sense, a in origin also certain, not really the kingdoms as such, but you know their 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 rulers a. Um, a kind of a similar uh, mindset. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's naturally very um, difficult to to say something. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I don't know how clear it was at this point, because um, I tendentially like to stress how non-centralized these powers really were, uh, I mean, or better, in, in the case of Sicily really I, I do like to stress how centralized it was, but at the same time it's important to, to give you a clear depiction that, yeah, these, these were centralized but in l relative terms, mm -hmm. so that it's very important to look at the world thing being definitely able to say, oh, this was more or less, in this case, centralized than another. But at the same time, looking at what the essential, you know, in absolute terms, what the actual power of these rulers still was. And it's difficult to talk about the Norman Kingdom of Sicily and the Kingdom of Sicily in general, especially in um, between the... Um, I would say from from the beginning to the up to the Angevin domination, let's say, because this was <laughs> objectively um, a kingdom that had a huge potential mm, that, for several reasons, didn't didn't make it to become something rare. Mm. Um, this happened because of definitely of the Successory crisis of the Oatville, so that the the main um, problem was to to maintain a continuity also into the Norman um, domination. As the Swabians, uh, I, as as many of you probably already know, I love the Swabians. 
um, but to be fully honest about this, that we're still foreigners, and this is easily observable by how also the reaction to this. When we talk about the Swabians, we, we like naturally to concentrate on, on Frederick II, that was this, you know, central figure that naturally had a uh, a very strong relation with Sicily. He felt he was actually half German and half Norman, but he felt more Sicilian than 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 German, for instance. Um, even though I'm not saying that he didn't care about Germany at all. On the contrary, he was very attached to Germany as well. But he had been ra raised in Sicily, and he, all his political um, uh, theory was um, based. Uh, his political you know, life was based on trying to centralize as much as possible into the kingdom of Sicily and making, and actually letting Germany go, or at least acting into Germany not anymore in a um, exclusively in a public fashion as emperor, but also trying essentially to expand as a private dynast into other lands of the empire, chiefly um, not just Swabia that he already owned, but also Austria that now was suffering a political crisis and he was trying to, to get into it. And eventually the Habsburgs would, would, would have filled that gap, but also the Bohemians tried it. That's another story. But the point I'm, as I'm trying to, to make is that eventually Frederick reign was very short. I mean, let's be honest about it. The, the Normans is extinguished in main line, so that Constance married Henry VI. So Henry VI, first of all, made a war to seize the kingdom. And he also died quite early. So eventually the kingdom enters in this phase of, of trouble because there is no... because Frederick II is still a minor, he cannot rule, and the he is actually in all stage of the local German um, nobles that had been sent come with, with his father who wanted to use the kingdom of Sicily like a kind of a uh, you know, enjoying place more than one and then else. So, really pillaging and, and not having, in this sense, a strategical dimension of the thing of how to use such a uh, strong and important kingdom into the, an internet on a broader strategical level in a grand strategic pro project. These were just lords who were s uh, placed in there who cared about just making money and definitely increasing their own power uh, for personal profit. Then eventually with Frederick II there is this moment of greater, you know, of revival of the kingdom, but it was also a very tormented rule as well as the, uh, uh, the, the, the kingdom was uh, constantly at war, practically, al almost. It was even invaded by the papal armies. You know, it wasn't really a great period. There were lots of damages also by this continuous struggle with the Lombard League, all resources that were drawn from the Kingdom of Sicily. And, and at this point, you find this kind of already a decline of a weakening of the social structures. And you realize, especially at a, from a military point of view, because you, you see that... Um, the, the feudal levies do not work anymore this context. It doesn't mean really that the situation was so bad, but um, the the uh, the expenses were high. This system, the, the whole society was changing also in this kingdom. Not so slow, not so fast, but definitely in a way that was very difficult to control. Um, and in um, the uh, the the main problem was uh, continuous costs, continuous instability, as always. So that even Frederick's armies, as we've seen, eventually suffered defeats. They against the Lombards, they, mm, they were becoming essentially mercenary armies as well, because this is also to consider. Uh, after Frederick's that Manfred kind of kept this uh, kingdom as a, uh, you know, uh, in this sense, taking his father's legacy, uh, even if he, was, if he was an illegitimate, but you see that that was still a kingdom that didn't respond very much. Most of these armies were definitely made up by uh, mercenaries as well, German mercenaries, by the way. Um, so even foreigners from the 
from the uh, southern Italian perspective, um, when the Angevins uh, f uh, set for, for a crusade to, to reconquer the kingdom against Manfred, who had been excommunicated by the Papacy, it's always the Papacy, you see, trying to seize once again this kingdom in a way or in another. Um, the, 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 the southern Italian nobility uh, abandoned Manfred, and he died, you know, heroically in the famous Battle of, of Benevent. And 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 obviously we all like the you know the the romance of the the Swabians. This extremely uh, fascinating uh, dynasty that is, is romantically depicted in this sense. Also, Manfred is a kind of a roman that's being romanticized. Into. But you have to think that political reality was a bit more crude than that. So eventually, when it Angevins seized the control of the kingdom, much of what had been the Norman and Swabian uh, institutions were kind of crumbling. Um, and they actually managed, actually, uh, the Angevins are usually said, or, oh, those were the true foreigners, because as long as there were the Normans and the, the, uh, the, the Swabians, everything worked well. Uh, yeah, as long as the Normans, yeah. I agree with that. With Swabians, not so much. Once again, if you look at the uh, what the Angevins actually did, they weren't actually that bad, really. I mean, they tried. First of all, they continued to use what what was left of the Norman and Swabian tradition. They kind of uh, they were clever. The Angevins were clever. They used the kingdom in a in a bit of a different fashion, in the sense that now they were true. <laughs> you know. I, the problem is, is exactly this, is that after the Normans, everybody who came ruling in there was ex essentially an external force. So, in the case of the Swabians, mm, after all, there wasn't a great deal of um, this equality, because objectively the Swabian power into Germany itself wasn't that big. So Sicily represented really the bulk of the fortune of the Owenstaufen at that point. But with the Angevins and eventually the Aragonese, objectively, these these were kind of vice kingdoms, in a sense. Well, okay, vice kingdom is a title mostly was used by the Aragonese, to only the truth. The Angevins were still probably a kingdom. They wanted, in fact, to stress the same continuity with the former kingdom for sa the sake of legitimacy, but they were essentially subordinated to, a, to another power that was the one of France. Mm -hmm. The Angevins at this point had reached, in fact, the apex of their power in the sense that, that there was this uh, French Angevin empire, more than else, that um, was um, stretching from the Channel to the to Greece, essentially. It was enormous. It dominated. It was the hegemonic force of Europe. So, the Kingdom of Sicily, for how big? could be, really, being a very big chunk of this empire, it still was subordinated to this greater thing. Mm -hmm. Also in here, let's not stress it too much, because naturally also the, I don't know, Charles of Anjou was a ruler in his own regard, with Sicily and Provence, then his brothers, I don't know, Louis IX, that was the king of France proper, so there was sometimes even partial lack of coordination, but I mean, broadly speaking, these were still French powers that remained kind of supportive all the time and cooperating the one with the other. Um, so, w eventually, this this kingdom was squeezed by all the wars that were, in, in especially, I think, the economical crisis that arrived beginning in the 14th century that made everything kind of collapse. So, at this point, the barons seized all uh, great part of the power into the kingdom of Sicily they in this sense they weakened the centralized forms that had been created into the um, into the kingdom irreversibly mm -hmm. uh, in the 18th century with the enlightened reforms that there was a with the Bourbon dynasty it was kind of an attempt to, to fix things but it was lost mm -hmm. but everything started from here so if you look at uh, excuse me, as uh, at kingdoms like France and England, it was that they were definitely the, the strongest um, 
powers as kingdoms proper. Maybe just Castilla um, being something similar in power, but it was a bit different. You, you realize that it doesn't matter what, you know, all the mess that happened in France and England, I mean, these kingdoms were about to collapse so many times, let's be honest about it, it wasn't easy for them, but they still made it. There was still a continuity with a rule, it doesn't matter how, you know, dynasties that could change naturally and so on, but the point is that we're still respectively French and English powers. Um, okay, yeah, the, the, the first Anglo-Norman kingdom was in fact a French kingdom <laughs> of England. I know it sounds bad, sorry British you, uh, audience, I, I don't want to, to say anything wrong, but uh, the point on the contrary, in fact, that I'm making is that eventually that became the Kingdom of England and maintained its kind of English character in nature, in continuity, in, and so on, in legacy. So with the Kingdom of Sicily, this failed. It's one of those kingdoms that paradoxically failed, having had remaining kingdoms, but being ch so radically changed from the within that they lost a huge opportunity. At least the Kingdom of Germany failed as a wall, you know, up to which, uh, the, the, up to the Swabians, there could be a, a kind of national monarchy in Germany as well, like in France and England. Then eventually everything collapsed and you say, okay, well, yeah, okay, the, the Kingdom remained, was, was more an empire, it was fed, f had a federal um, political culture, it was a very complicated thing, it, 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 it de facto split it up in so many dynasties practically. The Kingdom of Sicily said continued, but it was as, as if it was emptied from those factors that hadn't made it so great in, ever, in the first centuries. It could bring theoretically to uh, an extremely developed and functional state into, into the history of, of Europe. Um, and indeed, the Kingdom of Sicily was actually very well put, very well placed, also in still in modern times. I mean, it was a, a power on its own, but still continuously, say, balanced with these internal struggles between the monarchy and the nobility. Mm -hmm. So naturally this story passed through many complicated things, just even strictly biological ones, as we've seen, I don't know, the extinction of the male line of the Oatville dynasty, or the precocious death of Henry VI, and the minority of Frederick II, and, um, it passed through military events, it passed through battles like Benevento or Tagliacozzo, you know, if Conradin of Swabia had won over Charles, uh, of, uh, Charles of Anjou, well, we might have had a, a wholly different story. Mm. Um, and so these are fascinating things, and I hope that today I kind of managed to give a bit of a of a broader picture of how especially the in, in this case, of how the internal balance of of the uh, of the kingdom really was uh, in political and administrative terms, and this was just a, a very plain introduction, because things are ex enormously more complicated, and maybe one at one point we'll get m more into into detail with this. But aside from this. Um, I just, as always, I hope that you enjoyed this video, if you did, please share it, and uh, otherwise leave a like, or a dislike, if I deserve a dislike, um, or subscribe to my channel if you are interested in my upcoming contents, and for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me, I wish you a nice time, and see you next time, bye.